we can choose the earlier start date, which is there. Early start date. Uh, and this is the world. We want to go to the realms map mode, start off with. And there you can see lots of things you can play as. So the world... The world is design is divided into counties. Like we've got the county of Leicester, we've got the county of Northampton, we've got the county of Warwick. Uh, counties make up duchies. There are certain counties that are de jure part of a particular duchy, and then duchies make up kingdoms. Kingdoms make up empires. Uh, it's all about vassal vassal liege relationships. So this would be the King of Mercia here. He's actually a petty duke. A petty duke is somebody who holds a sort of historical kingdom that's really only a duchy. It's only a duchy inside. So he is the petty king of Mercia. And this orangey blob here, that is his land. That is what he owns. He won't personally, he only, you can see from, well, I can see from the map, that he personally owns Leicester and Northampton. And these other places are vassal to him. So he owns them in the sense that they are his vassals. He doesn't directly hold the land. We can get more into that later. We've got all these map modes that tell you things. Um, when you're first starting, like, because you can start as, for example, we could start as this little county here, Bullith. Um... And then you would just be a count. All you would hold there is one county and you're surrounded by dudes who own one or two counties. So it's a difficult start. That's the um that's the, the sort of the smallest start that you can have as a county. And you can go all the way up to over here. You could play as you could start playing as this fella, the emperor or Basilius of the uh, Byzantine Empire which would obviously give you a more powerful start by a fucking long shot, or even the Abbasids over here. Huge, huge empire. Um, so it's an asymmetrical game. You can start tiny, or you can start huge. It's up to you. Uh, starting huge is less fun, really, you know, because you've already won. At the start of the game, the Abbasids, are, you know, it's easy. They can just go wherever they want. Um, what you can also do is, if we have a look at uh, counts, you can see counts and dukes. So we could play as this count, Sheikh Zayd of Al Jalf. Uh, this count is a vassal of uh, the Abbasid Emperor. So you can play. You can. You don't have to be independent at the start. You can play as a vassal of somebody else and work your way up. That's kind of interesting. It's more restrictive because obviously. Um, what's Captain Nemo saying? <laughs> empire equals speedrun. Yeah. If you start as an empire, you've, 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 you've won. You've done. Well done. Um, yeah, so you can start as a vassal of somebody else. Uh, that restricts what you can do, but obviously being inside the Abyssin Empire, you get a ton of protection. Like nobody's attacking you because to attack you, they've got to attack your liege, and to attack your liege would be suicide. And, but you, as a, as a duke or a count within that empire, you can expand. So you can grab land, and then eventually what you'd want to do is declare yourself independent from your liege when you get powerful enough. So that's an interesting way to play. I think, yes, I think the two interesting ways to play are sort of a vassal of a, vassal of a reasonable-sized uh, kingdom or, say, Lombardy. You know, you're, it's, it's big-ish, but not huge. You could play as a vassal of Lombardy or play as somebody completely independent or, some, or Mercia. They're small enough to be interesting. Uh, I like starting as a Welsh count. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, Ireland is often called Tutorial Island because uh, it's an easy start, but it's only really an easy start in the 1066 start, which is here. The world looks a bit different, you see. If you play if you play Ireland on the earlier starts, you'll be tribal and pagan, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with being tribal and pagan, but it adds more complication uh, to the game, really. I think for your first game, in fact, for your first game, if you've got no DLC, you'll have to play as Catholic Feudal. So either go on the 1066 start and choose somebody in Ireland. What's nice about Ireland is you're kind of, you know, you're protected by the ocean and everybody's about the same size. So you've got no huge enemies that are going to stomp over you. So if you start, you know, if you start as this, this dude here, this duke, who's got control of three counties, only one directly, but he's got three counties. He can conquer Ireland, form the Kingdom of Ireland, and then move on from there. It's a good, it's a good easy start. But 
I like starting on the earlier start because then you get more time in the game. So I should just uh, pick somebody and get into the game. Uh, let's just let's just go with Mercia because that's all simplish. So I am King Offer, who made Offer's Dyke, which was a tiny ditch to keep the Welsh out. I don't know how that worked. Okay, so when you start a game, you get all these rules. They sort of don't matter. You can change anything you want to change. But what I do recommend is always turn Shattered Retreat off. Shattered Retreat is an absolute pain in the arse and you don't want it on. Uh, if you, Lorash asks, can you directly control more than one county or do you need, uh, yeah, you can, yeah, uh, I'll get into the game and I'll show you about that. So, actually we don't, probably don't want Iron Man, well, I might need to reload. So we'll load the game. Okay, so this tell, this gives you a lot of information about the game, and then it tells me I'm Anglo-Saxon Catholic feudal. So this tells me the, the features of being an Anglo-Saxon. This tells me if the features of being, you know, blah, blah, blah. It tells you all the stuff you can do. For example, the Pope can grant divorces. If you're a, if you're a Muslim, the Pope doesn't grant divorces, you know. Different depending on your culture and religion. Uh, this map mode is the, this is the default map mode, which is territory, like land, actual land, and it's awful. You always uh, if you press W, these are your map modes down here. You've got a ton of them. W is realms, which is sort of independent places. Uh, that's probably the map mode that you want to be on most of the time. So right, holding counties. So I am King Offer of Mercia. This is me. I'm all I'm wearing a Santa hat for some reason, and this is the stuff. This is my territory that I control, but this is the stuff that I own directly. So the Petty Kingdom of Mercia, which is just really a title, uh, you know, a, a kingdom title doesn't... You know, well, I should put it this way. The only the only title that inherently gives you land is a county. For example, you can, you can hold a duchy title, but not actually own any of the land inside the duchy. You just have... Those counts will be your vassals, but they don't like that. So a, a county is really the only land. The other ones are collections of counties and then collections of duchies and so on. So I, I control the Kingdom of Mercia, the petty Kingdom of Mercia, which is all of this. But I only directly control the county of Leicester and uh, the county of Northampton, which are these two. So this is land that I personally hold the title to myself. Uh, Nemo says, yeah, Santa hat makes a lot of sense at this time of year. So I personally hold these two counties, and then this dude in Derby, for example, he is the Count of Derby, Earl in this culture. The, the, the titles change name depending on your culture, but this is a count, so we say county. It, as an Anglo-Saxon, he's called an Earl. Uh, and I am his liege. So he controls these two counties directly. He holds them himself, but I'm his liege, so I control him. And the whole game is about those, you know, vassal liege relationships. Um, if we pop over to let's have a look at the Byzantines. So the empire, the emperor of the Byzantines, owns all of these. He only owns three counties directly. He holds the Duchy of Thrace, which is there, uh, the empire, and then a couple of counties. But and all of the rest of this are, you know, his vassals. So there's that. Now what I could do in Mercia, so say I want to hold all of this land myself. I could just go to go to the go to the um, the Count of Derby and what's that, Lancaster, and I can revoke his title. He probably wouldn't agree to that, he would declare war on me, but I could win the war, revoke his title, and then I hold that county directly. So I could take all of this land for myself and own all of these counties myself. But then that's where this comes in. This is the domain size which depends on your stewardship stat. We'll get into that later. But your domain size limits, based on your, stati your stats, your domain size limits how many counties you can directly hold. Uh, and if you go over that, you'll make uh, less money uh, and you'll make have less troops. So generally, you don't want to hold all the land yourself. There's a style of play called North Korea mode where you do hold all the land yourself and just take the penalties which is a perfectly valid way of playing, but not very historically uh, accurate. The other thing is your vassal limit, which is how many of these people, how many vassals you can have under you. Uh, if you 
<laughs> yeah, the North Korea mode is great. Yeah, there's, there's two there's two variations with North Korea mode. One is you just hold hold everything yourself. The other one is you give everything out to people, but you keep them all in prison all the time so they can't rebel against you, which is pretty great too. Um, yeah, what was I saying? Uh, so the domain size. So say say if I'd taken too much land and I was getting to my, uh, my sorry, my vassal, vassal size, my vassal limit, I'm currently four out of 25, so no danger of that. But say if I took a, a shit ton of counties and I was up to 25 out of 25, that's fine. What I would do then is I would make duchies. So I've just changed the duchy mode, which is I. That's one of the map modes. I press I to look at it. So you see that uh, this isn't in my territory at the moment, but if it were, Yorkshire, oh, what's that? Yordale, York, and Leeds makes up one duchy. So if I created that duchy and then picked one of these counts and gave him the duchy title, then instead of having three vassals, three count level vassals, I then only have one duke level vassal. So that takes my me that would take me down by two. I'm replacing three vassals with one higher level vassal, and then the same for if I eventually conquered, you know, all of this, I could give the kingdom of it's as long as I was an emperor, I can give the kingdom of Ireland to a vassal, and then it's still under my control, but not directly. He's ruling it for me. Uh, the general rule is if you're a duke, you can give out counties as vassals. If you're a king, you can have dukes as vassals. You know, if you're a duke and you make another duchy, uh, then that would become independent because it's the same level as you. So it's, it's I mean, the base game is land. Land is power, and, and counties are land. So you want to control as many counties as possible. You want as many for yourself as possible, but then all the rest, you know, you give out to people under your control. And what you ideally want is, say I owned uh, this duchy here, uh, you want one person for each county, and then you make the duchy and give it to one of those people. Uh, people get pissed off if um, the duchy title is not held by somebody who holds land within the duchy. They don't like that. Uh, the vassal limit can be raised, yeah. It's based uh, essentially on your if you mouse over it here. So um, I'm, a, I'm a petty king, which gives me a king rank of base 10. And then I get some for my diplomacy and some for my laws. So basically, it's partly how big your biggest title is. So an emperor gets more vassals than a king. A king gets more vassals than a duke. And then uh, based on your diplomacy stat, you get a few more on top of that. And then based on your laws, which we'll get to later, you can get more. Um, that's, that's basically it. Uh, sort of how the Duke of Edinburgh is in Scottish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they don't like that. Uh, they, they like... They like uh, the duke owning land within the duchy um so you want to keep it like that but i mean your main concern as a king the bigger you get the more this matters is you want you want your vassals to be quite powerful because the more powerful they are the more men and money they're going to supply you with but you don't want them too powerful you don't want them powerful enough to challenge you or to you know group up make alliances with each other and challenge you so it's a balancing act of keeping them sort of powerful but not powerful enough to fuck you up Right, so that's land. I think land is. Oh, I should probably. Okay, so within within a county, you also have baronies. These are these things here. So we've got a castle, we've got a town, and we've got a church. And all of these are barony level holdings. Uh, these don't really. You never really play as a baron. Uh, you assign people to these. Like if you hold a barony title, you need to assign it to somebody because it's unseemly for somebody of your quality to hold a barony level title. They're scum. They're getting towards the peasants who we don't care about at all. Um, the principal, you, you, this castle here, this is where I live. So this is the, the principal holding in the county of Leicester. It is Leicester, the county capital, and that's a castle. So you always want a castle as your primary holding. That's my castle. And because it's my castle, I can build stuff in it. And that's something you want to do. But that's land. It goes baronies, counties, duchies, kingdoms, and then empires. Uh, and the map modes for that are, so, uh, what's the county? I don't know what the county, is there a county? There's no county map mode. Counties you can just see because of the borders. Then I will show you, oh, we should probably talk about du jour and de facto. So as I'm looking at it now with this map mode on, it's telling me what is the du jour count, uh, duchy of York. This is the du jour duchy of York. But it's possible, so say we had a Duke of York and he owned these three counties or controlled these three counties. He could then go on to conquer Durham 
and then that would be de facto part of the Duchy of York. Uh, but it's not de jure part of the Duchy of York, so that would piss people off. So you generally want to keep things as close as, at least in terms of your vassals, you want to keep things within their de jure sensible designations. Uh, I think that makes sense. It's, de jure is like what is historically and lawfully the case. So all of these four counties are historically and lawfully part of the Duchy of Leicester. But that doesn't mean, that, you know, they can go out of that. Somebody else could own them, but you want to you wanna generally sort of tidy things up and keep things de jour. Uh, Rob asks, am I de jour about that? That's, that's very good. Um, okay, so we get so that's de jour, de jour duchies, and then we can have a look at de jour kingdoms. So this that's the de jour kingdom of England. Now, if I conquered half of that, I could create the Kingdom of England title for myself, and I would be King of England, but that doesn't mean I control all the territory. But it gives me de jure claim over the rest. To go to war with somebody, you need a claim, and creating the title of England would give me a de jure claim over all of England. So then, so if I go back to what is reality, if I say if I conquered you know, this and got half of it and, and created the Kingdom of England, I could then go to war freely with this lot and take it for myself. So it's all about getting claims. So that's the your kingdoms. So you've got your kingdom, Pickland, uh, Wales, England, Ireland, and then de jure empires. So if I got I got the empire title, I'd have de jure on all of that. So we've got the, the empire of Britannia, the empire of Francia, Hispania, Italia, and so on. Uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Um, uh, what should I talk about next? So I should probably talk about these stats. So that's your money, that's self-explanatory. That's your prestige, which is just a reflection of how well you're doing. Prestige is kind of a currency. You spend it on things and you get it for things, but it's it's mainly just your score. It's a score that you can spend. Uh, piety is similar. It's you know how pious you're being, how, how much you're um, doing the right thing by the Pope, in my case. Uh, again, piety can sort of be spent on things. Uh, you just want to stock that up. It's not a big deal. Domain size I've mentioned, so that's how much, how many counties you can hold yourself. Um, holding duchies or kingdoms doesn't count towards your domain size because it doesn't, as I say, only a county inherently confers land. Uh, domain is spelled Demesne, and for quite a while when we first started playing this, we thought that's how it was pronounced. It's medieval French, and we thought it was Demesne, so we said Demesne. Um, vassal limit, as I've said, is just how many vassals you can have under your control, which is based on your diplomacy and, and how powerful you are. That's just your realm size. That doesn't really matter. And that's your score. Every time you die, every time this character dies, his current prestige gets added to your score. And that's how score is calculated. Um, so I should talk about like me as a person. So that's, you know, that's the kingdom that I own. And this is me as a man. I'm King Offer of Mercia. I have an heir. Um, the game over state is if if I didn't have this heir, if I had, if you pretend these are my children, pretend I didn't have any children and I didn't have any brothers and sisters, I didn't have any, this is my dynasty. So say there was nobody else in my dynasty and I got killed, then that's game over. It's game over when you don't have a dynastic heir and you die, basically, or you get dethroned. So obviously... Maintaining your dynasty and more particularly your direct family is really fucking important. So these are the stats I've got. So this is diplo This is state diplomacy. This affects, as I say, this is. Uh, I probably shouldn't go into everything this, that this affects, but essentially diplomacy dictates how much people like you. Uh, then there's martial, which is you know how well you're going to do with, with fighting. Uh, stewardship, that one's important. That's how much money you get from land. And also uh, dictates your domain size, which is kind of important, how much land you can hold directly. So stewardship, at least the way I play, like stewardship is probably the most important stat, the one you want to worry about the most. Uh, intrigue is, is for murdering and plotting and, and that kind of thing. I don't do that a great deal, but if you do, that's important. And then state learning is how fast you learn technology and how fast it spreads. Uh, what's, what's Nemo saying? You and your direct descendants, if applicable, <laughs> died. Yes. So when you're playing, you're sort of very concerned about who your heir is and how good he is. So this is my current heir. He's nine years old. 
and he's okay. I can train up him up to be a reasonable king. So you you know you want you want the highest stats possible. The high, the higher your stats are, the better you're gonna do. I need a sip of tea. So the game is very much about you know finding a good wife. Is she a good wife? She's not a bad wife. Finding a good, good wife, having good children, you know, and so on and so on. So if I wanted to betroth my um, how is this learning? It's not learning of Linux. It's learning of CK2 while using Linux. You're not going to learn any Linux here. So if I wanted to betroth my son to somebody, you know, you look for somebody. Here's all the stats here. You can sort it by stats. Look for somebody with good stats and then marry your son to them so they get good children. There's also tra traits like uh, uh, there's no geniuses around, but there's a genius trait, which, you know, automatically makes people better. A quick trait. Yeah, we've got no, we've got no geniuses or quicks yet. Uh, somebody probably can help you with Linux, but not here. Uh, you also get these, I should probably get back to me, you get these traits here which modify things about your character. This is all, this is this is sort of where it gets very complicated. There's lots of stuff going on here, but I should just probably walk through it. This is me, this is my wife. If I had a liege, he would appear here, but I don't, I'm independent. I think that's not the star, the star says that it's me. Okay. Uh, this border around my character, it says King Offer, but I'm really a duke, and this border is a is a, is a duke level border. If we go to an actual king, we see he's got like a gold border, and then if we go to an emperor, like the Byzantines, we see that he's got like a really fancy border. I have uh, quite a lot of the DLCs, but not all of them. Le two. Okay, so here we can see my family, that's my parents, my grandparents, and more importantly, my children. I have one son and four daughters. Uh, daughters aren't a lot of use to me under my current election laws, uh, or succession laws, rather. We'll get into that in a bit. Uh, it tells you my dynasty, that's my house, my dynasty. It tells me how many living members and how many total members there are. There's information there. Uh, this this stuff is DLC stuff. Actually, the ambition isn't. So I can choose an ambition here. I will choose and make a friend. And I will choose, this is, this bit, choose a focus, is from the Way of Life DLC. I'm going to choose, you can choose, you can see that they align to particular stats. So this one is about stewardship, these two rather. These two are about learning, these two are about diplomacy, these two are about intrigue, and these two are about fighting. I'm gonna, so I like hunting. Hunting's a balance between you get a bit of health and you get a bit of martial, which is pretty cool. Uh, where next? Um, uh, yeah, this stuff, uh, this is whether I'm leading armies or not. You know, you, you generally, it's good to have your king leading armies in that he will do well because, you know, he's a good leader of troops, but he can also die. So I, I never, ever have my uh, king leading armies. And here I can cut his hair, which is pretty great. Let's give him stupid hair. There we go. Okay, so that's me. This is my family. Family is important. I should get on to this. So that's, this is my council. You can have... Oh, I should put... Yeah, I should go through these tactics first. Here are all my vassals. So these are people that hold land um, that is under my control. It's under their direct control, but I control them. So I've got a, I've got, I've got a few counts uh, and then a few baronial level holdings. So we've got, a, we've got a mayor, which is a city baron, and we've got a bishop, which is a church baron. This game is CK2, Matt. You might like it. Okay, give me a second. Okay, just getting comfortable. Okay, so these are my vassals. So that's where you see your vassals. You can see how much they like you. How much they like you is important. Because if they do like you, um, they will uh, give you more men. And they'll give you more money. If they don't like you, uh, they will rebel against you and go independent or overthrow you or, you know, that kind of shit. You don't want any of that. These are people who are in your court, which will include some of your vassals, your direct vassals from your counties, but also just people hanging around in your court. Uh, they can be useful. Uh, this is packed, so I've got... I've got um, yeah, Mercy is a little bit complicated in this regard. The uh, blue packs tend to be alliances, so I've, I've got... 
It's really a Caesarian tributary relationship with these dudes, but let's just say it's an alliance for now. So all of these dudes will do what I say, and they will come to fight if I want them to fight. Uh, yeah, the UI's tiny. Uh, yeah, the UI, the UI doesn't scale very well. At 1440, the UI is barely fucking readable. Uh, and then abroad is just... Uh, do you know what? I don't know what abroad is. Oh, cor courtiers who are currently abroad. I never use that tab. So that's that. These are these. Are, yeah. Okay. So from your from your people in your court can be employed in your council. This is the council. You've got a chancellor who deals with most importantly fabricating claims uh, because you need a claim to. You can't just attack anyone. You need a claim. At least as a Catholic, you need as a, you need a claim to attack people. Uh, he can also improve relationships, or so dissent, or you know like those kinds of things. Here's your marshal, your war leader. He can research tech. He can raise troops. He can you know do a bunch of stuff. Um, let's so let's let's do the chancellor and the marshal first. So say I want to fabricate a claim on Surrey. So he's there. He's going to fabricate a claim for me eventually. It's uh, the fabricating a claim thing is kind of just a dice roll. Like every month, it will roll a dice and see whether you've managed to fabricate the claim or not. So it can take a while. Um, let's put my marshal researching military tech there. This is a spy master who can you know do spy mastery things. Uh, I'll put him on study. Like we've not got anything cooking at the moment, so I'll put him studying technology over there because they're technologically advanced. Sorry, not sorry. Exactly. Uh, and we've got our court chaplain. So if any of my territories were not Catholic, I would want to convert them to Catholic. But if we see from the religion tab, we're pretty Catholic. We're doing all right. So he doesn't need to do that. He can also hunt apostates, which gets you a bit more piety by burning people at the stake and stuff. You know, torturing people for not being religious enough. Uh, research cultural tech or improve religious relations. So the chancellor can improve relations with lords. The uh, chaplain can improve religious relations with, you know, church holders, basically baronial level church holders. I think that's what that does. I never do that. Okay. Uh, laws. This is where it gets more interesting. So you can see there, this is the Petty Kingdom of Mercia. If you hold multiple kingdom titles, you'll have different laws for each for each kingdom, potentially. Uh, we can see that currently, what's my inheritance? My inheritance, you might not be able to read it, but is agnetic, cognatic, gavel kind. Um, agnetic means males first. Cognatic means females. Agnetic means males only. Agnetic, cognatic means males and then females. Fully cognatic means males and females equally. Uh, so those are the gender laws. And then the succession laws, we've got gavelkind, seniority, primogeniture, elective monarchy, and ultimogeniture. These can be different depending on, um, depending on your culture. Uh, they fall into sorts, though. So gavelkind is the fucking worst. If you're playing somebody with gavelkind, you want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Under Gavelkind, the primary title, which would in my case be Lester, goes to the oldest son, in the case of Agnatic, Gavelkind. Uh, and then any other holdings that I have get shared out amongst my other sons. So every time you die, essentially you, your kingdom splits apart and gets you, 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 you control less land. So Gavelkind is shit. You want to get rid of Gavelkind. Uh, do your daughters have blood drops because they are <laughs> cycles or anything? No, they have blood. The blood drop means somebody who's my relation. So if I look in my courts and scroll down, she's got a blood drop because she's my daughter. People without blood drops are different dynasties. So blood drop means um, closely related to you and in your dynasty, obviously. Uh, you see, my, my son would have a blood drop. But he's also my heir, so he gets the crown instead. If I had another son here, a younger son, he'd have the blood drop. Uh, so yeah, so Gavelkind, essentially, what Gavelkind is essentially why England, why Ireland never forms up, because some 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 duke will conquer a bit of land, and then when he dies, it will split apart again, and then this duke will conquer a bit of land, and when he dies, it will split apart again. Gavelkind is a pain in the fucking ass, and you want to get away from Gavelkind as quickly as possible. Uh, so. Primogeniture, that's the normal one. That means eldest son inherits. If there isn't a son, 
eldest daughter inherits in the case of agnetic cognetic. Um, elective monarchy, all the... Uh, not 100% on how this works, but if you're a king, all of your dukes vote on who will be the next king. And they can essentially vote for anybody. So you, you could end up with a non-dynastic heir and lose your kingdom uh, under elective. Elective is very powerful because you get to choose your best heir. But if your dukes don't follow suit and choose the same heir, you can be fucked. Uh, if that were the case, for instance, say if I held the Kingdom of England and it was elective monarchy and my child was not elected as the next king, then I lose control of the Kingdom of England. Somebody else would have it, but I retain the land. So the stuff that's in your direct domain, the counties that I directly own, I would retain those and I would be the vassal of the next king, which, you know, is okay. Like you get to carry on playing, but you know, that's a bit of a, a bit of a step down. You don't want that. So uh, elective, yeah. So primogeniture is the normal one. Elective is elective. Uh, ultimogeniture is like primogeniture, but your youngest uh, son, in most cases, possibly daughter, but your youngest child will inherit, and that's handy because then you get longer reigns. Because you can see, like, if I'm, you know, in this game, you get married at sixteen, so I'm probably going to have a kid at sixteen. So the by the time I die at seventy, my kid is like, you know, fifty-five, sixty. So not going to last long on the throne. So longer reigns, you get longer reigns with ultimogeniture. And you can also, you can also decide to stop having children when you get a good one with primogeniture, just the eldest child inherits. Um, it's, it's, it's simple. Uh, what's going on? I used to do elective quite a bit. Yeah. Matt likes elective. It's stressful, but you can choose who you want. It's pretty cool. If you can, yeah, if you're, sh if you're sure you can manage elective, it's pretty powerful because you can choose anybody you want. If you're a Muslim, you have um, open succession, which just means the um, the whichever child you basically pick a child by default, the eldest child or the, rather the eldest son will inherit. Uh, but if you give a son land, he will inherit because essentially the, el the the child with the most power inherits. So you can just pick a son, give him land, and he will inherit, and that's fucking great. Being a Muslim is great. Uh, tanistry, yeah. So in I, I think I think it's specific to Irish culture, the Irish uh, culture group. Because uh, okay, yeah, I should probably talk about cultures. So I'm Anglo-Saxon over here, which is a West Germanic culture. So I have sort of if I go to the culture um, map mode, which is T, you see the culture groups. Like similar cult, similar cultures have similar colours. So Saxon that is Germanic is similar to Anglo-Saxon, which is Germanic. Uh, Irish, Pictish, uh, Cornish down here, and Breton, they all have similar colours because they're all Celtic. So that's how cultures work. Um, and different cultures sort of get on with each other better. Uh, for example, if I, you know, if I conquer, if I conquer Saxony, uh, they'll hate me less than if I conquered um, Ireland because Ireland is Celtic and I'm Germanic. Uh, so they don't be they don't like being ro ruled over by somebody who's that foreign to them. Uh, doesn't tend to be a huge deal because you just conquer what you want to conquer, but that's the thing. So tanistry is specific. I think it's specific. It might be Welsh as well, but I think it's specific to Irish. And tanistry is very much like elective monarchy. Uh, but I think who is it who gets the vote in tanistry, Matt? Is it everybody? Is it counts and above? But essentially, Tanistry is like elective monarchy, but they have to choose somebody inside your dynasty. So you don't get the situation where you lose control of the kingdom. So that's pretty cool. So yeah, if, if Tanistry is available, go for Tanistry. Uh, does this all make sense so far? So it's, I mean, what I'm trying to get across is the structure, how the land works, you know, counts, counts and then dukes and then kingdoms. Uh, and then, and then the family stuff. Like those are the two important things at the moment. Right. Okay. Good. Uh, so I'll carry on across these tabs. So there's my, the my laws, my inheritance laws of the Kingdom of Mercia. So that's where you choose your your your, your laws. Um, there are there are conditions in order to change your laws. So if you mouse over this question mark here, it tells me. Uh, not previously changed the succession law, has reigned for at least 10 years, is at peace, is not in a regency, blah, 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 blah. So there are all these conditions for me to change the law. So I will actually change the law 
to Ultimogeniture, which won't make any difference in this case. It's still my only son is my heir. So that's how you change the laws. There might be situations where you don't meet the conditions to change the laws, and that can be frustrating. Um, okay, so we've got the realm laws. Uh, you get different... So I, I'm, I, I call myself a king, but I'm really a duke. So I get I get this stuff. If I, if I were a king, I would get more options here. And then if I were an emperor, you get even more. So I can choose my centralization as a duke, uh, which is really a payoff between domain size which is how much land I can control directly, and vassal limit, which is how many vassals I can have. So early game, I tend to aim for medium. I can't get it yet because of uh, technology. But I aim for medium because that gives me a little bit more domain size, which means I control a little bit more land myself, which makes me a bit more powerful in relation to my vassals, which tends to be good. Uh, obligations. So this is basically taxis. Uh, sorry, not taxis. Taxes and vassals. Uh, and levies, rather. So levies, so anybody who is your liege, from your land directly, you get everything. So from Leicester, I get all the tax, and I get all the levies, levies being fighty men. Uh, from, say, Lindsay, which is my vassal, I get some of the levy and some of the tax. And this is where you set how much, the obligations. So I, I'm on normal vassals, which means I get minus 20% of their levy. Uh, feudal taxation non. The reason why I'm on feudal, feudal taxation non is good because the economy in this game is real. So if I take money off this dude who is my vassal, he has less to spend upgrading his shit. So I'd rather he keep all his money and upgrade his shit and then he'll give me more men. Uh, yeah. So this is just basically just how much tax uh, castles, cities, and uh, uh, cities, tax and levies. That cities and, and, and churches, tribal, all those different things, how many levies and how much money they give you. You can set all that there. Having said that, I rarely touch this. Like the defaults are fine for this. For the realm stuff, I, I fiddle. But for obligations, I tend to just leave that on default. Um, yeah, so that's that's laws and ting. Whew, okay, Crusader Petty Kings. So this is technology. Technology used to be even more complicated, but it's still quite complicated. Um, so just over time, depending on my learning stat, and, and oh yeah, I should also mention, yeah. These figures in brackets here next to your stats, these are your, so that's my personal stat for, say, diplomacy. The one next to it is my state stat, which is um, my, so the state stat is my learning plus, I think, some proportion of my chancellor's learning plus half of my wife's learning, something like that. So the state stats come from you plus your council. So you want higher stats on your council members in the applicable um, category plus your wife. That's what determines state stats. And your state learning will determine uh, how fast technology spreads. So I'm essentially, when I'm doing technology research, I'm doing it in Leicester. And it will spread out to other counties. And they will also spread into me. So, you know, technology sort of has a multiplier effect on in the game. Uh, and as you accrue... What, what, does it call, what does the game call it? Sort of technology points? Yeah. So you get military, economic, and cultural technology points. And you can spend them on these things. And I won't go through all of these, but... So under military, military organization is great. That gives your armies more morale. And morale is what matters in armies. Uh, you got building works going on, can sell the guide stop every <laughs> yeah. Yeah, somebody's building something. Uh, economic advances, so if I put more money into town infrastructure, then I get the, when you hover over these, it will tell you what they do. I'll get more money from towns and you know, this is, this is self-explanatory. It's technology and you upgrade it and that makes things better. Um, military, we'll skip over that one for now. Intrigue is where you do things all manner of things uh so i can do a plot there's all these plots that i can do so i could plot to revoke worcester from this dude if i want worcester for myself uh i can plot to kill a bunch of people that's plots uh over here is um wait, how do i get back there uh decisions so i can, can this is shut the shut the gates is from reaper's due so basically if, the, if there's an epidemic coming in which there isn't there's no epidemics anywhere currently I can shut the gates and protect my family. So 
I can recruit a, fort, uh, a court physician, promote a commander, invite a holy man to court, invite a noble to court. Invite a noble to court is handy whenever you conquer a new place and you need a new vassal. You want to invite a holy man, uh, sorry, invite a noble to court and give him the land or a holy man. Um, you can hold feasts, you can hold a summer fair, you can borrow money from the Jews, you can go on a grand hunt, all kinds of stuff you can do there in the intrigue tab. <laughs> Pseudo says that this game makes zero sense. It's a complicated game, but it's it's wonderful because it is so fucking complicated. So many things can happen. So many stories come out of it. Like a big story anus. Uh, factions. So if my lords were plotting against me, this is where that would show up. And I would try and bribe them or murder them or something to get them to stop. Uh, religion tab. No idea. Honestly, I never look at this. It's, there's the Pope. You can never look at the Pope. You can bribe the Pope. You can give him money. You can plot to kill him. You can ask for a divorce. You want to keep on good... If a Catholic, you want to keep on good terms with the Pope. Because, you know, you're going to want to ask him for divorces now and then. Otherwise, no idea what that tab's all about. You can appoint bishops. I don't... I ignore that because I don't know what the fuck I'm doing there. Um, societies. This is... Uh, what's the DLC this comes with? What's it called? I'll get it. I can't remember. Anyway, there's some DLC where you get secret societies. So as a Catholic, I can join the Benedictine Order, the Dominican Order, the Hermetic Society, or Lucifer's Own. And they all let you do different things. I'm going to join the Benedictine Order, because that's pretty great. So if I mouse over these ranks, it tells me what I can do at those ranks. Um, I'm not going to bother explaining that now. You can join secret societies. It's pretty cool. Monks and Mystics. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, and Lorash as well, the monk one. Yeah, Monks and Mystics gets you secret societies. Secret societies are fun. I recommend that. Rob always goes Lucifer's own or whatever cultural equivalent. And then he kidnaps people's dwarves and tortures them and turns them into monsters and does all crazy shit. When we're playing multiplayer, Rob is a fucking menace because he's always in Lucifer's own. Kidnapping people's people all over the shop. He's a little monkey. Uh, so I skipped one. What did I skip? Oh, I skipped military. Right. I've not even talked about military yet. So, I own this land myself, so I can I can raise troops from it. And they would be my personal levies, which are represented by this button here on the army levies tab. Raised personal levies. There we go. I just raised my personal levies. I have, what's that? About 500 personal levies. I can select them by drawing a box, and I can right-click to tell them to move together. The game's paused at the moment, so they won't, but you get the gist. My personal levies are my levies from the land I directly control. That makes sense, right? Uh, vassal levies are levies from your vassals, which are, as we've talked about, affected by these things here. I can tell them to give me more or fewer men from these things here. So let's raise my vassal levies and see how many I've got. I've got like 200 and a bit. So about, that's what that's like, about 700 men altogether. Let's put them together in Leicester and see how many we've got. I'll unpause it for the sake of uh, that. Uh, I usually play on speed 2. We tend to like speed 2. Speed 3. Like speed 2 can be slow at times. When you're waiting for a claim to fabricate, speed 2 can seem really slow. But when stuff starts happening, it can be pretty hectic. So some people like playing on like speed four or five and just, and just you know, pressing space to pause every time they have to make a decision and then carrying on and then pausing. That's fine too. Play however you're comfortable. I like playing on speed two because I feel like it's more like immersive. Like it feels it's a, it's a big lengthy game with stuff happening and slow bits and fast bits. That's more fun. Uh, fighty men, sorry, fighty men, Nemo. That is the historical term. That is correct. So I think if I explain... Oh, okay, I should probably do a little bit more about the military tab. So this shit down here, this big list of people, these are all my vassals. This graphy thing here represents how many men they're giving me out of how many men they could possibly give me. So using this dude as an example, his opinion of me is 31. You can always you can always get to people just by clicking on their portraits. You know, you just click, click around portraits and you can have a look at them. And this number here will always be how much they like you. And then these two numbers here are how much they like their liege and how much their liege likes them, which is, again, me in this case. Um, but yeah, just clicking, clicking on a portrait anywhere will always get you to that person. 
and there's a little back button here if you want to go back to somebody you just saw so you know that's how you look around people in the game so back to that military tab so these are my these are my vassals this is how much they like me which is gonna partially determine how many troops they give me so we see here this is the earl of where is the earl of worcester so let's find him he's he's the dude from there he could give me right he could give me 455 troops um potentially but because of laws i can only raise 24.8 of those oh sorry the laws gives me minus 20 percent and his opinion gives me 31 percent which balances out to 24.8 percent which is 113 men uh yeah, so that's that's how that works. It's basically based on laws and opinion. Uh, the only one of those you affect in the short term is opinion. So you want your vassals to fucking love you, then they'll give you the full, in this case, 80% of men, rather than the 31% he's giving me now. Uh, this dude's giving me a lot of men, which is nice, even though he doesn't like me very much. So I don't understand what's going on there. Uh, yeah. He's, uh, oh no, sorry, no. He's giving <laughs> he's giving me two out of two men, which is why that is full. Um, yeah, so that's where you see how many how many men each vassal is is giving you. Uh, you've also got mercenaries, which you can hire for money. They take money to hire, and they take pay every month. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. You've got a lot of mercenary bands you can hire. Uh, I I can't afford to hire any of them currently because I've got fifty six gold. Holy orders, uh, which don't exist yet, but when they when they exist, you can uh, you can convince them to come into your wars, and this is where any allies would be. Uh, you've got your fleet levies, which is where you raise your boats. I'm pretty much landlocked, so I don't have any fleet levies at the moment. But you raise boats, you put men on the boats, and then you send them to wherever you're doing war. Boats are boats. We all understand how boats work. Uh, is anybody saying anything that's anything? Two out of two, a whole lot of men. Well said, Rob. Uh, retinues, this is a thing from um, Legacy of Rome. Uh, the more powerful you are, the more retinue you can raise. And a retinue is like a little standing army that takes a great deal of money to raise initially, but doesn't take much to support. These dudes, they cost a fucking fortune to support. Uh, am I paused again? Yeah, so I'm paused. So if I mouse over my economy thing, you can see that they're costing me 1.72 gold a month, which is quite a lot of money. I got a little pop up. So this is a Benedict. This is because I'm in the Benedictine order. They're asking me uh, to go and look at how wine is made, which I will go and do. So this is my army, which is made up of both my personal levies and my um, vassal levies. Uh, there's a lot of buttons here. So this is each. So each lord. I'll pause it again. Each lord sends you men. So this is just a bunch of armies grouped together at the moment. So this is you know. The Earl of Wighead is sending me this. The Mercian Army, that's my army, Mercian Army. So it's just a bunch of armies from a bunch of different people. Uh, this button gets rid of them. I would unraise them. You want to do that in friendly territory, because otherwise you lose men. Uh, this button groups them together into one army. So now this is one army, which is what we want. And I can choose... Oh, I should... Uh, oh, yeah. I should. <laughs> this is always something that you've got to mention. Uh, yeah. Okay, so minor titles... Uh, this is partially, um, what are they called? Uh, what's the term? I can't remember the term. What's the term? Honorary, that's the term. Honorary titles, like, des well, designated regent actually has a function, but uh, master of the horse, master of the hunt, high almoner, cup bearer. They're titles that don't come with any land. They just make people like you a bit more. So you can, all you can give all those out. Uh, I will hide those for now. These are your commanders. Uh, I I'll tick auto-assign commanders. So these dudes are my commanders. Uh, you can micromanage that or you can auto-assign, up to you. Uh, and I can put those those dudes, and here they are, in charge of my army. So he can go there and he can go on that flank. So you've got three flanks in the army, the middle, the left, and the right. Ideally, you want you know the best commander in each position. You can look at their stats. Some are better at leading the left. Some are better at reading, leading the center or more appropriate. Uh, you can look at that or you can just you know pick the top one, which is what I do. Generally speaking... Um, the bigger army will win in this game. Battle is actually quite complicated, but 90% of the time, if you've got more men, you'll win. And if you've got like, you know, 150 or 200% of their men, you'll pretty much definitely win. So 
while technology and all these stats and everything matters for war, really, just as long as you've got more men, you'll tend to win. So if I had a claim, which I do not, I'm sorry, because this dude has not made me a claim yet, I could march my army. Well, no, I couldn't march my army. You can't actually declare war with people raised. But okay, what I would do, let's get rid of the army then. So let's pretend that this fella has successfully fabricated a claim on Surrey. I would go to Surrey. This is the leader of Surrey. Oh, you can right click on a territory. If you left click on a territory, you get the little information panel about the territory. Uh, if you right click on a territory, uh, you get the person who rules it. <laughs> generally speaking, generally speaking, you will win. Um, I should probably quickly actually talk about Dejoa. So if I go to, let's go to Middlesex. I click on the county shield of Middlesex, which gives me information about it. It's got that's what it contains. It's got a city, a bishopric, and a barony. Um, if I tick this de jure button, it will show me things that 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 county is de jure part of. So it is de jure part of the petty kingdom of Essex, which is this, which is a petty kingdom is a duchy, uh, which is a de jure part of the kingdom of England, which is all that which is a de jure part of the Empire of Britannia. So if you ever want to see what is de jure of what, that's handy, as well as just pressing I, I-O-P, to look at the de jure empires, kingdoms, uh, and duchies in reverse order. So what is it doing? Okay, so I right-click on Middlesex. No, not Middlesex. Sorry, because I want to declare war on this dude. I right-click. I would declare war. I don't have a Cassus belly right now because I haven't fabricated a claim, so I can't do it, but let's pretend. I declare war on this dude. And he's like, oh, fuck you. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to beat you up. And then, I, so I go here, go to army levies. I raise my personal levies and my liege levies. And I march them all down there. And then when they're all down there, I would march them into Surrey and I would attack. Uh, I should probably unpause so that I hopefully... Oh, there we go. I just got a claim. So let's take that claim. I can't, right, I can't declare war with this army raised. That was really good timing. Okay. So let's get rid of this, get rid of this army. I've got to wait till he finishes marching now. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Stop, stop there. Okay, let's get rid of him. So now I've got a claim. Oh, actually before that, I'll quickly mention these things. So the, these roundy buttons at the top, these tell you there's shit for you to do. CK2 does always listen. Never never say while playing King CK2, never say out loud, I hope my king doesn't die, because you can guarantee in the next five minutes your fucking king will die. So these roundy buttons just tell you you've got stuff to do. You've got stuff to deal with. So that tells me I can make a decision to shut the gates uh, or recruit a court position. So I'll do that. There we go. Yep. Uh, this tells me one title that can be created. Okay, because I own two of the three counties in this duchy, or in this de jure duchy that doesn't yet exist, I can create the duchy of Lancaster. Uh, I actually can't because I don't have enough money. If I mouse over the button to create, it will tell me why I can't. But in, in potentially, I can create that duchy because I, I control two of the three counties. You have to control um, more than half in order to do that. Drew, do you think... Your kingdom will die. I'm just curious. Uh, in CK2, never. In real life, yes. The UK. The UK is on the way out. Uh, okay, yeah. So I can I can create a I can potentially create that duchy. This tells me. Oh yeah, crown folk. This is a thing. This is a thing from um, uh, Reapers Jew. You can set crown focus, which will give me events to aid the prosperity of a particular county. So you just deal with all these buttons. This tells me I can grant I can grant minor 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 titles, and this one is telling me that my my people are pissed off because I've raised their. If you have vassal levies raised for too long, they get pissed off. The people you raise them from, understandably, and all that does is affects their their um, uh, opinion of you. So let's have a look at somebody. So. Uh, yeah, when you mouse over uh, somebody's opinion of you, it tells you all the pluses and minuses. If I if I'd had troops raised for a very long time, it would say you know minus fifteen raised levies. Um, he actually really likes me though, so that's cool. Anyway, so we're declaring war on Surrey because we just fabricated a claim. I mean, first of all, since my chancellor has 
uh, fabricated the claim, I'd want to move him out there, but he's not even been there long enough for me to move him yet. He did that very quickly. So if, if that wasn't, weren't the case, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd maybe go fabricate a claim on Wessex and move him there. Um, right, so let's get this war declared. You, Earl Bordora of Surrey. So when you declare war on somebody, first of all, this, these stats tell you these are these stats, but for other people, or, you know, for you if you're looking at yourself. So we see that he's got 412 men. If you mouse over that, it shows you how many he can have potentially. So potentially he can have 454 plus 2, so 456 potentially. I have got 756 men. So I'm probably going to beat him, which is good. Uh, and I also want to check pacts and make sure he hasn't got any allies. He's got some. Uh, he's got a non-aggression pact, which is green, but he doesn't have a blue alliance, so I don't need to worry about that. He's got no allies. So... I think I can take him, so I declare war on him for Surrey. And I raise my armies, uh, and I tell them to march together. I'll put them in bed. Mm. See, be, until my armies are together, he can attack them and maybe hurt them. So I don't want to raise the, I don't want to get them together too close to him. So let's go to Warwick. Let's get them together in Warwick. I can now, I can also because these people are allied with me. I can call them all into my war, which I will do. This flag up here is telling me that. So this is stuff to deal with, you know, somewhat immediately. So I'm asking this dude, uh, King Ethelred of East Anglia, to join my war. He will maybe join my war, this says. So let's send that. I click again, and I can ask uh, Duke Ecbert of Kent. I can ask King Utrid of Hwick. And I can ask King Sigurd of Essex. Uh, and they will all come into my war, which will be fucking great. So let's just, you know, unpause and let my troops march together. So he's raised his 418 men and he's going to try and attack my shit. Like a dick bend. Uh, Octorov says, you can't move him, Drew. He's busy fabricating the claim that you are using again. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, so all my allies, allies are blue, enemies are red, neutrals are grey, and I'm green. So my allies are all coming in to help me. We've got all these events popping up. See, this, this is actually what makes CK2 great, is all these weird fucking events that lead to really weird things going on. I'm not reading them out or anything, because, you know, if you play the game, you'll get these cool events and you'll make decisions. So, you know, you make a decision here, do you want that, or do you want that? So, yeah, find that. Okay, let's get my army together. And what I want to do to win a war... To, okay, so down here. This is kind of similar, similar-ish to Solaris. I'll see. Yeah, he's caught He's caught 99 of my troops with 418 of his. So he's going to win that little battle. Uh, I could just bring these dudes in and hopefully get there in time. So let's do that. Uh, you get the war score thing, a bit like Solaris. This tells you stuff about the war. So this is me. I'm the attacker. Here are my allies. Here's the defender, he doesn't have any allies, and this is what we're fighting over. So if I click on that, it shows me we're fighting over Surrey. There's the war score, there won't be any yet, but when, I, when we've got war score, you get war score for winning battles. As the attacker, you can get up to 75% of the war score for winning battles, and also for sieging down holdings. Uh, holdings being those little places inside county. So a county, you don't siege down a county, you siege down the castles, churches, and cities within the county. So we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, Rob, 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 Rob's evil in this game, essentially. That's what you need to know. Rob's a monster. So let's march on. I might as well just march all my men here and hit his army. This is how you do war. You march men against other men. Okay, so all my men are there now, and they beat his army. So when an army is beaten, or rather, an army is beaten when their morale runs out. So I, I don't know if you can make it out on the stream. But there's a number of troops there, and then there's a bar. And his bar is entirely red, because his, his morale completely gone. My morale is full. So armies aren't beaten when they're all killed. They're beaten when they run out of morale, and they run off. So there will be some men left. So I could chase him down, but if I attacked him again straight away, because he doesn't have much morale, he would essentially just like run away again. So you want to wait for his morale to come back a little bit so you can actually go and kill some of his dudes. 
uh, let's get this army together. So I've got 2,189 men. That's partly me and partly uh, my allies. You can see that when you mouse over. Uh, the ally orders. What's that, Matt? Uh, but for now, so I'm going to march this army down to Surrey because I want to siege those places in Surrey down to get some war score. Uh, you can see in the war score, I'm currently 22% war score. I lost that tiny skirmish battle, and then I won a bigger battle for 22%. Oh, as an attack, yeah. There's uh, okay. So on an army, there are there are always these little buttons. So that chain would attach my army to somebody else's army in the territory, an allied army. Uh, I think with this stuff, really, you just want to... The important ones are split in half, grouped together, which would be there if I weren't already grouped together, and uh, disband. You always want to disband in your own territory. The rest, I think I think you can get from just sort of yeah, rolling over them and uh, having a look. So, okay, this army is now sieging down the first place and we can see that it's got 268 defenders and i've got 2466 attackers if i had fewer attackers than defenders i would not be able to siege this down but i have plenty of attackers so i am sieging this down the hand uh what hand what's that doing oh oh okay so yeah so if i was the leader of a war and i had allies clicking this hand here would order my allies to come to me and attach their armies to me, which can be useful in a in a in a in a, a shared war. Okay, so I just sieged I sieged Lambeth. So that was the first place. So that place is sieged now. So now I'm sieging this place, uh, which has 301 men. I don't really. If you've got kind of about 10 times as more uh, more attackers than defenders, you can click this button and attempt an assault. If you try it with less than that, you'll just lose a lot of men. But uh, I'll do that for the sake of uh, brevity. Oh, well, let's, oh, well, I will assault these holdings. Uh, yeah, okay. So let's win this war. Okay. So uh, when you're at war, on the attack, so this was my war goal. So I'm going to get the most war score from attack. I mean, he's only got one county, but let's, pre let's pretend he had more than one county. I get the most war score for sieging down stuff in the war goal. If I go for too long without sieging stuff down that is in the war goal, I'm, I'm going to get ticking war score against me. So a all a defender has to do to win the war, it would take a long time, but it's just stopped me from sieging down stuff in the war goal because that ticking war score would count against the attacker. Uh, as, so that's kind of what you want to do as the defender is just beat their armies and stop them sieging stuff down. You can also siege their stuff down and get a bit of war score that way. But essentially you get war score from battles and you get war score from sieging stuff down. So I won a battle, and I seized all this stuff down, and now I've got 100% war score. So I offer peace. I enforce my demands, because there's also white peace. If, you, if, you, if you're in a war that's just lasting too long and it's not going anywhere, you can offer white peace, which means nobody gets anything in terms of prestige. It, sorry, in terms of land. You will lose some prestige from backing out of the war. Or you can surrender, which means they got what they want. You know, If somebody's attacking you and it's like hopeless, like, rather than fighting on, you can just surrender and give him what he, what he uh, declared war for. So there we go. Now the county of Surrey is now mine. And this is now telling me up here that my domain is too big. Because now I own three out of two of my domain size. Because I got this territory for myself. So let's unraise my army. Get rid of him. He's in friendly territory. Uh, oh, hang on. Due to enemy presence in our home, oh yeah, okay. So we don't want to do that. There's technically enemies in my homeland, so I'll march them home and then I'll and then I'll unraise them. So that's me. I now control directly the county of Surrey, but I'm three out of two on domain size, which is going to impact my ability to make money and raise troops. So I don't want to hold the Surrey for myself. So what I will do is I'll go to intrigue. I'll invite a noble to court. Uh, he's fine. I will marry him off so he doesn't marry somebody fucking stupid. Let's marry him. Oh, oh look, she's attractive. Ooh, let's marry him to her. So that basically sends a letter. Oh, no, that happened Im immediately. Sometimes that will take a while. In this case, it happened immediately. So then I right-click on him. I didn't even mention that, did I? On characters, like, you can right-click and do stuff. So I can plot to kill him, and I can assign Guardian. I can, you know, all these all these things I can do by right-clicking. In this case, I want to grant him a landed title. I want to grant him the County of Surrey. And because that's a lower title than mine, he is now my vassal. He is the new Count of Surrey. Look, he gets a fancy border and a cool moustache. 
Congratulations, Earl Keen. I'm sorry. Uh, attractiveness. Uh, I can tell you. Uh, diplomacy plus one and attraction and opinion plus 30. So that's anybody who can potentially be sexually attracted to this character gets a plus 30 uh, relationship bonus. So that means in, in this case, heterosexual men and homosexual women will be plus 30 with this woman. And people will want to fuck her more, which means she'll probably have more children than average. Uh, I should talk about guardianship since that came up. So here's my son. Uh, here's me. I'm shit. I have shitty... Well, they're not actually terrible. But, you know, your starting king is never going to be amazing. Uh, this is my career. So when you come of age, you get a career. I'm a naive appeaser, which is the... So there's a career associated with each of these stats. Uh, this naive appeaser is basically the lowest level diplomacy career. So it's, the, it's a shit... I'm a shit diplomat, basically. I'm a terrible, terrible diplomat. So... Uh, I want my son to be guardianed by somebody who's going to make him, you know, ideally better than me. So let's look for somebody. So I assign guardian. Uh, on these things, you choose somebody on the left that you're doing a thing to and somebody on the right who you're doing a thing with. It can be the other way around. But So my son is on the left, so I'm going to choose a guardian for my son on the right. So I click there. I want somebody with high stewardship. Uh, that person's got high stewardship, but not. they've got a low-level stewardship career. This person's got a reasonably high-level military career, skilled tactician. Uh, I mean, early in the game, your choices are kind of limited. I'll show you in a second how to make them less limited, but you're pretty limited. I think I'm going to go with this dude. He's got a decent military career. He's got good traits. So he's brave, he's patient, he's charitable, and he's just. So these traits are likely to pass from guardian to child. Uh, there are in inherited traits like um, genius, quick, ugly, um, attractive. They're, they're inherited, you know, father and mother to son and daughter. You can't be taught to be quick or beautiful. Um, but these round traits, they, are, uh, they can be passed on. They can be taught, rather. So, yeah, I like her. I'll choose her as my guardian for my son. So if I go to family now, we can see that there's my son and heir. And that's, oh, it's actually my wife. My wife is his guardian. She's going to teach him cool shit. Um, how to be better than I am, which is, all, which is always great. You want your children to be better than you were. Uh, what was I going to say? Okay, so, yeah, okay. So, down in this area of the game, you've got, as I say, you've got the map modes like that and that and that. I've told you about these. You can just mouse over these and see what they are. A uh, bunch of stuff. Oh, that's a handy one. Diplomacy map mode is D, and that's how much people like you. Brighter green, they like you more. You can also check out the characters. So this is how much people like the king of middle Frank here. Uh, if I go to him and press D, uh, and so on and so on. Anyway, down here you've got other stuff. This is basically buttons for finding shit. You've got like, uh, what's that one? The Chronicle, which tells you about all the cool stuff you've done. You'll never look at that. Uh, main menu, Ledger, which tells you a shit ton of information about the game, about independent realms, religions, like what's going on in the world. That's handy from time to time. Uh, but the one I'm interested in now is find characters. So, let's look at my council. So my council is pretty shit. We've got a 19 there, but we've got it like a 12 and 9. So let's say I want to find a better steward. So this will search the entire world, or rather the entire world that I am in diplomatic range of. The higher your diplomacy stat, the further you can see into the world. All right. So I'm going to search the entire world for somebody with high stewardship. I want uh, gender. Oh, I want a male. Oh, yeah. The, on the only position on your council that it's okay to put a woman on in most, in most cultures is spymaster. If, if you make a woman chancellor... Uh, your, your your vassals will not like that. That is scandalous. Uh, so so I want a man. Uh, gender men. Uh, don't care whether he's in prison. Don't care whether he's married. Don't care. You know, rulers are relevant. Diplomatic range any. And then join court. So I want somebody who is willing to join my court. So this man here is the person in the world with the highest stewardship who is willing to join my court. He's currently the steward of Hwick which is actually my vassal, I think. Oh, no, it's not. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm going to steal this person off somebody and they're going to come to me. So I'm inviting him to court. That says he will say yes and it tells me why he will say yes. So I'll wait for him to come to court. I didn't mean to do that. So let's unpause and we'll get a letter from him soon saying he is willing to come to court. Uh, making this dude not my... Uh, who was I doing? Steward. We'll piss him off a bit. And he is my vassal, so that matters. But, you know. Kestlevi, motherfucker. Okay, so this blonde fuck has, has told me that he's willing to join my court. So now I can go... I can click on this appoint button with Steward. And I choose him. He's top because it will, you know, automatically sort by stewardship. So now I've got a steward with stewardship 11. So that's better. So that's how you manage. So that's what the invite... This, this whole thing... So you can do this for anything, you know, if you're looking for a wife, if you're looking for somebody to guardian your children, if you're looking for commanders to lead your army, anytime you're looking for somebody in the world, you can use that. Uh, there is a shortcut key for that, but I tend not to use it. What is it? Full stop? No? Comma? Uh, no, it's full stop, yeah. Okay. Oh, and you can save filters and load filters there. So, you know, once you've set up these filters for like people who can be on your council you can like so i could save to slot zero for you know that's that's the one i use when i'm looking for somebody for my council so that i mean i think that's basically the game Whew. so you can't complain so okay so what would i do next in this game so i've got sorry uh and i've pressed i to see uh de jure duchies and i see that sorry is part of this duchy here so next, I will probably want to conquer, conquer Sussex, and then I could create the Duchy of um, whatever Duchy this is, Kent, I think. I could create the Duchy of Kent, and then I would have de jure on the final county, uh, Kent. So I wouldn't need to fabricate a claim on Kent if I did that. So let's let's pretend I'm doing that and do that. Uh, I clicked on the wrong button, so I'm, I can't do that for a while. I've told him to improve relationships with my vassal, so he's off doing that now. Uh, which one? Which one is the elves? Uh, let's have a look. The elves. Who would be the elves at this time? I think. I think the elves would be the Lombards in Corsica. Is that is that Corsica? Which one's Corsica? That's an elf, Sardinia, and Corsica. Theme of Sardinia. Okay, that's, I was right. Okay, that's Corsica. I think the elves are the people of Corsica. This is Warhammer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have I still got vassals? Love these ways to know. Oh, I do. Yeah, let's get rid of that army. You don't want to keep your army raised because it will piss off the people you raised it from. Uh, but I think that's pretty much it. And you just, you know, sort of, uh, let's go back to what I actually own. You just you just conquer land. You you make claims. You conquer land. You get more land. You create duchies. You assign dukes. You become a king, blah, blah, blah. And you just sort of roll on from there. But more than that, I mean, it is a strategy game. That's the kind of game it is. But that's not really why you play. You play for the stories. It's like I took, I took this one county in Wales through, you know, to owning half of Europe. And this happened and that happened. You know, it's that stuff. Good. A good start. An, a an actual CK2 stream would be very boring. It would just be this. Uh, no, I've not conquered the whole world. I can, I can actually load a game, couldn't I? So I'll, I'll show you my one of my most successful games. Oh, I've quit the entire game. Okay. I'll load it again. Uh, I think you probably can conquer. I don't think I don't know if you can conquer the entire world because you run into uh, you run into vassal limit. But yeah, I mean you can conquer a lot of it. I mean if you've got really good stats, then you could potentially conquer a massive. Um... Yeah. Anyway, let me load a game. What have I got? Oh, somebody joined. Who's joined? Uh, I want my Iron Man. I'm a Mercia. Hi. Hello, I'm streaming, Drew. Hello, stream.
Okay, so that's 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 one where I'm I'm doing quite well. I started off as uh, I started off here. Actually, I should play, shouldn't I? So I started off here with uh, like this duchy, maybe a couple of counties in this duchy. I was a vassal of the Umyads in in Spain, Hispania. And uh, it's it's 996, so I'm only I'm only about like halfway through the game there. Uh, yeah, this is actually <laughs> this is actually broken though because this is this is a save from before the most recent patch. So these counties didn't exist in the game at that point, and now they do, uh, which is kind of messed it up. Uh, this is why there's green blobs everywhere. That's not mold. Uh, but yeah, I I own all of that, which is pretty pretty big and pretty hard to manage. I've got I've got a lot of men. I've got sixty three thousand men in that game. So, yeah. But the, the problem problem with this game is not like so I'm huge. The problem now is I can't get any bigger because I'm up to my vassal limit. So that's I'm stuck there until I can get a better dude with better stats and you know get more land. But yeah, you can you can get pretty big. Uh, but then you know you only look at the entire map. You know what am I like a, a tenth of it, something like that. I fulfilled Napoleon's dream. Yes, yeah. Of, uh, of making some brandy. But yeah, that's the game. That's how you play CK two, and it's good, and you should play it. Yeah, the, the Tamagot. Yeah, it is yeah yeah. At that point, you are just the Tamagotchi stage. Where you're just looking after your dudes and trying to make the best, the best air possible. Who's my air? Yeah, my air currently is Prince Aram of the Everdeenid Empire. He is uh, a Mirza, Miz which means he's he's uh, patriarchally, uh, pa uh, patrilineally descended from the Prophet Muhammad. He is a genius. He's patient. He's kind. He's just. He's charitable, and he's zealous. And he's only fifteen years old, and he's got these stats. He's pretty fucking great. So yeah, later in the game, you just you just you get better and better people because you get better at it. Good, Lorash. Yeah. Hopefully, like with CK two, because it is quite. If you just open up the game and try and play it, you don't have a fucking clue what to do. So you just need to take that edge off, so it's not too daunting, and you know, as long as you know roughly what to do, you can play the game. So yeah, I should probably end that there because I've clearly run out of anything to say. Let's, uh, let's resign, see how I'm doing. 72,000. I am better than House Duvria. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. If you just open CK2 up and you don't know, you don't know what you're doing, you just be like, this is just a map. This is just a map and lots of screens of information. CK2 is great, Nemo. It really is. Yeah, you should and Lorish, Lorish and Nemo should play with us. It's an excellent game. Oh, one one of the great things about this game, I didn't even mention it, is when you start, when you click, oh, when you start, you click around these counties, it does this. So fucking cool. I love that. Uh, Victor, you say victims. No, the thing is, right, when we play CK2 multiplayer, we don't we don't play co-op um, competitively. Because thing thing with this game is if you played competitively, you say, you know, say I was in Mercia, Matt was in, you know, I don't know, Brittany. We just because we're both humans, we're both very good. We're better at it than the AI. You know, humans are better at playing the game than the AI. Obviously, otherwise, you know, it'd be a very boring game. Um, it would just be a stalemate. It would be boring. We'd just be fighting each other perpetually, and that wouldn't be fun. So, I mean, you could play like that if you played at opposite ends of the map and you know tried to make immense empires and try and meet in the middle. That could be interesting. But generally, we just cooperate. Um, we used to um, we used to play quite close together and ally up. So. 
we would help each other in each other's wars. But as we got better at the game, that kind of made the game too easy. <laughs> like it was not not a challenge. Uh, so we've stopped doing that. But we, yeah, we just sort of play. We exist in the same world. We don't really interact hugely, um, at least not in terms of, you know, fighting each other. We just help each other out now and then and, uh, yeah, just share the world, really. <laughs> it's too easy. Yeah. So it's more just playing in a shared space than um, playing competitively. We don't we don't really do that because I don't think it'd be fun. I really don't think it'd be fun. Um, in the new in the Holy Fury DLC, there is this Shattered World mode though. I'll just show you that. Uh, this is new. So this basically, rather than having like historical countries, you just have very small duchies, and everybody is a small duchy. So this is like an attempt to make the game symmetrical. So if you wanted to play a competitive game, you probably want to play on this mode. And like, I just start over here and, you know, Matt would start over here and, you know, so on. And we just see we can get the biggest. Uh, there's also a randomized world mode, which is pretty cool, which makes, it makes, um, rather than it being the historically accurate world, it's a world that's plausible, but not historically accurate. So you'll have big empires and so on, but they won't be okay. So yeah, for example, here we've got you know, this is this is the uh, seven ninety seven sixty nine that never happened. We've got the kingdom of Askiayin in control of Ireland and Scotland. We've got <laughs> Lorraine Land as England, and uh, this is all this is all randomised with uh, uh, particularly interestingly randomised religions. So they are Lehomermernian. The Lohomoromarinian faith is one based largely upon the sense of touch, with adherents locking hands and holding each other's shoulders during prayers. Worshippers frequently embrace the pontiffs both before and after religious ceremony. Okay, so it just generates these weird ass religions and stuff, which is which is uh, pretty fucking cool. Laura Halora Lane Land, yeah. Uh, there are no naval battles, there are yeah, I mean you didn't really get naval battles at this time. Nobody had really worked out. The closest thing you got to a naval battle at this time was two boats with bows and arrows firing at each other. So it, uh, naval ba naval warfare doesn't really become interesting until cannons. Um, so they've just not put naval battles in. Na uh, ships are just for transport. But yeah, this, this random mode is great. This is what we've been... Because a problem with the base game is... Um, we're not, it's a problem after you've played for 800 hours. Uh, uh, but say, like, France is always big. So playing anywhere around here is kind of uninteresting because you're always going to just going to get stomped by France. So there's always a balance between, well, I've played all the places that are kind of interesting to play and, you know, anywhere else is too close to a big empire. Or Whereas this random mode, it's like, well, you know, usually I wouldn't want to play, you know, down by the Byzantine Empire because they're huge, but, you know, playing here could be interesting in this game or, you know, playing over here. It's good. Uh, yeah, es yeah, the ethnicities are, are mixed. So um, in the game we were playing the other day, Matt was over here in, uh, he was around, you know, I think he was here in Tibet. Uh, and he had, he had sort of a cross between Indian and Welsh culture, which is pretty cool. And he was he was sort of Catholic. He was this weird Indian Catholic with a pope. Yeah, it just mashes everything together. Yeah, yeah, a lot like Dwarf Fortress. Yeah, I mean Dwarf Fortress is obviously much much deeper in its uh, generation, but yeah, it's going down that kind of line. Yeah, I love random mode. It's kind of you know I was getting to the point where there was just you know I'd run out of places to, that were interesting to play, and this just opens it up again completely. Uh, that's part of, yeah, that's part of Holy Fury. So you need a... Oh, I didn't even mention... Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, you've got feudal and tribal government types in the game. You've got pagan, you've got Catholic, you've got Muslim, you've got various Indian religions, you've got Jews, you've got... That's all in there as well, but, you know, you can just learn that by playing it. So yeah, I think I'm done. Unless anybody's got any questions. Siberian wastes. Okay, so that's that.
I'll, uh, I'll end the stream. Uh, can you still choose to make it historical with an? Yeah, yeah. You get a lot of options when you do the random world. You can, yeah, you can choose what is historical and what isn't. You can have historical religions and everything else randomized, or yeah, it's up to you. No, not had a migraine yet, which is great. The music is great too. The CKT, I have the music off, but the music's fucking amazing. I just don't like music when I'm playing games. Thank you. The, the BRB screen was made by um, an idiot that I know. Uh, he did an awful job and he should be fucking ashamed of himself. Okay, goodbye. Thank you for watching. Please, please rate, subscribe, and sublime. Please sublime.